Good, good afternoon. It's two o'clock on Thursday afternoon, April 15th, 2021. This is a uh, climate Vermont Climate Council Steering Committee meeting. We have a quorum in attendance. We have an agenda which has been posted um, with the approval of the minutes as the first item. Uh, discussion of the agenda for the next full Climate Council meeting on April 26th. Uh, part of which will be to discuss clarifying um, the December 1 goal in law and the draft outline of the Climate Action Plan. And finally, a uh, subcommittee membership, not finally, but next a subcommittee membership update from Jane. And then uh, Secretary Moore will report on the legislative testimony that she and uh, uh, Liz and Chris uh, Campany attended last week with that one. Following that, we'll have public comment. And uh, does anyone have questions, concerns, or additions they would like to recommend to the agenda? Okay. Seeing no hands and hearing none, um, we can take up agenda item one, which is review and approval of the April 1, 2021 minutes. So why don't you go ahead, David? Sure, just our usual routine here, folks. Take a look at that real quick. It's hyperlinked in the agenda. Any concerns, let's raise it up now or we'll consider them approved by you. So any concerns? I see shaking heads, that's great. Okay, so not hearing any concerns, let's consider those approved by you. Steering committee, thanks so much. So as usual, we're gonna be super tight on time today. I mean, that's just the reality. We've got some very interesting things to talk about, so let's dive into it. What I'd love to do with the um, Climate Council agenda for the 26th is I'd like to walk through the each piece, but not dive in yet, and then circle back, because I know I wanna circle back on the December 1 goal and that outline that's shared, that's hyperlinked in there. And then also just touch on a few other things that require a little bit of thinking, particularly the role and function of the council in coming months we want to talk about. But let's walk through each piece just so we have a vision of what the whole thing is. And then we'll circle back. And we're going to try to do this all by quarter of. So let's see how we do. Um, if you don't have it in front of you, um, I would link it up right now. Um, I wonder even, Jane, if you want to share your screen with the thing. I always seem to get really bogged down on my machine when I share the screen here. Um, but if folks want to do that, um, we sent around, it's hyperlinked in your agenda here, the draft agenda for the 26th. And that draft agenda um, has a number of uh, big ticket items and some smaller ticket items. There it is. Great. Thanks, Jane. Appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> we start out with one of the bigger ticket items, which is this draft outline of the, the climate action plan. And the pur purpose here is to continue the conversations we've had here in the steering committee. We've, we've sort of teased at them a little bit in the full council, and we really want to go there and use the draft that Jane um, and others have put together that we can improve today as a, a launching off place. The purpose of that conversation about looking at that December 1 goal and about the climate action plan is to help everybody understand what's inside and what's not going to really make it or how we're going to talk about the things that we didn't fully finish by December 1. That's what we're trying to do. We want to circle back in this meeting right now and spend some time looking at that draft. So that's the first thing we want to do. We're putting that on the agenda for a little less than an hour. And let's talk if we think we need a little more time than that. The second big ticket item is to talk about public and stakeholder engagement. And the way we want to talk about it is to invite the Just Transition Subcommittee to talk a little bit about how they're thinking about it and also to have the consultants, the recently hired consultants, um, talk about their plan. Just Transitions is going to um, uh, talk about this tonight with the consultants. And so this is an opportunity to circle back uh, with the full council and say, this is the vision for how to do this well and to do it with the lens of justice and equity. And this is what we'd be expecting of the other subcommittees and their work. This is what we'd be expecting on the full council and public engagement work. So that's what we're hoping to do there and clarify the public and stakeholder engagement. Uh, and do that from the lens of the Just Transition uh, Subcommittee. We're also inserting public comment um, higher up in this agenda. You'll see that before the break. We want to 
invite public comment on those on those agenda topics we will have just covered. Then we have a couple quick hit items after the break, <clears throat> an update on the legislative testimony um, and an update on what the administration is thinking about uh, a funding proposal um, and how that relates to climate initiatives. So uh, uh, Julie Moore, Secretary Moore can can do that for us in the full council and, and we'll flick at those today too. And then there's one more big ticket item I call at the end here, which is trying to get our hands around the best way for the council to function in the coming months when the when much of the work is getting done in the working groups or the excuse me, the subcommittees. And so uh, we want to suggest uh, a potential change there, but we want to talk about it with you all steering committee today. Uh, and it's a it's a suggestion about maybe uh, somewhat shorter meetings, but more frequent and really focusing on providing guidance and help looking across the different subcommittees. So that's the agenda for the 26th in my sort of fast pass through it. Um, before we dive into specific topics like getting into the December 1st deliverable or talking about a proposal for the council work going forward, are there things that you're missing from this agenda or things that overall you think we, we should adjust and change or how are you feeling about the overall flow of this agenda? Any thoughts, uh, Secretary Young? Yes, thank you. Um, I don't know. I mean, we can do a test drive of the legislative testimony update today. We have it for five minutes today, but we seem to have it for 15 minutes on the 26th. Um, so I would think that the discussion of the American Recovery Plan Act funding proposal um, could warrant a little more time, in particular because there are secretaries on the full council, such as Commissioner Tierney, um, I'm not sure if Josh Hanford's not on the committee, but uh, um, the Agency of Commerce uh, Secretary is on the um, full council that that maybe we could do a little bit more than just I mean, kind of give you the full picture of it and give the opportunity for the other executive members um, who are council members to talk uh, about some of the other pieces. So I guess that's a long winded way of saying maybe we could give um, 10 extra minutes uh, uh, from the legislative testimony update to the uh, American Recovery Plan funding proposal. Okay. Okay, great. And then Julie could defer to others, um, you know, uh, council, executive council members who may want to add to the description. Does that work for you, Secretary Moore? It does. Thank you. Right. Okay. Every Comfortable making that change? Okay, great. Anything else, Jared? Yeah, I just first, I think the agenda generally looks really good. Thanks to those who put thought into pulling it together. I might just offer, I'm wondering about, you know, I think that we've been really intentional and consistent of, with the liaison roles in terms of sharing information between the subcommittees. And I think that that's been working well and I know that you know we don't want to get to a place where in the full council meetings we're basically just rehashing what the subcommittees have been doing. But since, as others have said, you know there's so much work that's happening in the subcommittees right now, I wonder if it would be helpful to have kind of a standing item where it's just each subcommittee has four to five minutes to give the highest level updates so that we're as just a fail safe to make sure that you know the it, key information is is getting shared. Um, I, I wouldn't want that to take um, a big portion of the agenda or go as long as it did last time, but I do want to make sure that we're building in regular opportunities. Um, and, and maybe there's ways to do it outside of the council meeting in terms of written updates, but that just adds more work to people's plates. And I think if we could keep them short and sweet, it might be a nice recurring thing to just have some of those subcommittee updates that everyone else could hear. Yeah, it's interesting you say that, Jared. We, we sort of went back and forth on that with uh, Jane. Um, yeah. And Jane's got an idea about a sort of a quasi-alternative to that. J Jane, you want to go that real quick, and then Lauren, I'll jump over to you. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so David and I did talk about that, and this actually piggybacks on what Secretary Young just mentioned too. I, I think it's pretty much impossible to stick to five minutes to anything on an agenda with a group this large. So I often feel like erring on longer side makes more sense, um, and 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 then being happy when you're shorter. But I will just highlight um, that the idea of the last thing on the agenda and visit revisiting the role and meeting schedule for the climate council at large is intended to be sort of this sounding board for the subcommittee work to have these milestones to check in along the way um, more frequently in the coming months and provide a space really for subcommittee report outs um, I would just say that I, I don't see any reason or don't disagree that perhaps a four to five minute checkout from each of those subcommittees makes sense. But David and I, in the end, landed on a substantive time and commitment from Just Transitions this time, recognizing that their role right now is really critical in forming the other subcommittees about engagement and having a conversation there and hoping that we'll have another council meeting in two weeks from now or perhaps four to six weeks, whatever it works out to be, where the other subcommittees step up and have report outs at that point um, and allow us to focus more time and energy around these larger issues that need some attention right now to keep us on track for the for December 1st. Thanks. Thanks. Lauren, was your comment on this same topic or is it on a different topic? Same topic, yeah, jump right in, please. Yeah, I have to apologize if I'm being redundant to something Jane just said. I got the warning that my internet was unstable, so you cut out for a second there, Jane. Um, but I did just want to flag that in the process roadmap, uh, we incorporated that the co-chairs would regularly be convened by the steering committee and that there was a lot of support for that work uh, or that effort. And we haven't yet convened them in any of our meetings, and that might be potentially a more appropriate place to bring them, not necessarily because there wouldn't be that full transparency with the, the council, but I, I agree with Jane, five minutes from two code from uh, each of those committees seems really, really challenging. Mm. Yeah. And Liz, do you have a thought on this? Yeah, I, I was going to bring this up. I don't know where, but not not on the agenda item, but it maybe it fits given this conversation. Um, uh, we did hear at the legislative uh, testimony last week, as you'll hear some more about later, um, a request from some legislators for a little bit more substantive update on what the subcommittees are doing. And one idea I had that um, I'd like to just bring forward is um, actually short video updates um, that could be posted. It could be posted both on the AO, you know, on our website, as well as available uh, YouTube, et cetera. And legislators could also then use that link when they're we're working with their constituents um, as well as viewing it themselves. It's a super quick way to get updates that don't take as long as a written product and have an opportunity to be viewed, I think, more widely. So um, it's not a meeting per se. And I agree with the idea that taking a half an hour, which is what the exercise would come into on our agenda for just those updates is tough. So that is a asynchronous video opportunity for subcommittee updates that I would like to suggest. Interesting. Okay, so to, to summarize this, there's an interest in understanding what's going on across the subcommittees, right? There, there's different ways to do that. One way is to sort of each meeting, one subcommittee takes more protagonism, such as what was going to happen on the 26th with just transitions. Um, and then you sort of rotate on that. And or we could, as a steering committee, convene co-chairs and do that as a steering committee to sort of make sure we're looking across and the co-chairs are looking across. And you could potentially turn that into a video product too, right? Uh, or do some sort of video thing separate to get to Liz's point. Okay, that's what I heard. Circling it back to you, Jared, for the 26th, are you comfortable with the agenda the way it is now? And then let's talk about this when we talk about the role of the council going forward and then how to make this work going forward. Yeah, I'm comfortable with it as is. And I think those suggestions by others were good. Um, and maybe one option would be, you know, in the off week when we're not hosting a steering committee meeting, we we try to convene the, the co-chairs every other week or something like that. 
Um, and I like Liz's idea as well. But yeah, no, I'm happy to leave as is now as long as we flagged it and are going to have other strategies for making sure that communication and coordination is happening. Why don't we take advantage of this conversation um, and pivot right into what we want to uh, tease up in the meeting on the 26th, which is how the council makes best use of its time. Um, Secretary Young, did you want to jump in quickly before we do that or as part of that? I was just going to go back and respond to um, Jared's last and all those ideas. I, I kind of like the idea of the steering committee hearing from the co-chairs in a very comprehensive way what's going on and maybe that could be every other week or every three weeks and then we have a video that we can post which goes to Liz's thing if we keep it tight and um, you know keep it high level at first and then open it up to questions and answers later but we'll have the content right up front that's a combination so I love the ideas and we'll figure it out I'm sure that sounds really great and if we do that, and now let's talk a little bit about the council's role in this. <laughs> One of the things that Jane and I have been talking about is the fact that at this stage, doing four hour meetings or something along those lines every once a month doesn't really feel like the right path for the council. And maybe it's better to do something shorter and more frequent, and that will allow this more frequent sort of like checking in what's going on with the working groups or there's things we need to sort out in a particular week our uh, particular couple of weeks, we do that in the council meeting. How do people feel about that? Does that seem like a smart move? Um, we want to talk about it with the full council, but we want you all as a steering committee to chew on it right now to figure out what you all might propose as a steering committee. Any reactions to that? I think maybe the only thing worse than more meetings is a four hour meeting. So I'm uh, <laughs> I would be in support of us meeting more frequently, but for shorter. Spaces and time. OK. OK. And other reactions to that? Yeah, Jared. And it may not be that we have to do every two weeks we meet. It could be like we realize like, you know what? let's let's schedule out a few and we're going to do it every three weeks three weeks or something right because people are putting a lot of time into the subcommittees and we don't want to crush people uh, okay jane do you have a sort of feeling on this like your instinct on what would be the right balance between not crushing people's time but also being having the right role in this these few months when the, steer, the steering committees are really where the action is well, I guess I, I pose this question to all the steering committee members who are serving on subcommittees, but my thought is that these next few months are really critical. And I just have felt like the council and meeting for two hours every other week would be a, an obvious way to keep the subcommittees on task to ensure that we're meeting these critical milestones um, and allowing that cross pollination to happen. But I'm also hearing other suggestions here about the service of the sub the steering committee itself. So um, in perhaps being able to play that role, um, which which we outline the process roadmap as um, a way that to convene the co chairs. So I also just want to you know play devil's advocate on my own idea and yeah. uh, with David and suggest that there are alternative ways. So want really want to test if you all support the idea of every other week it is what I we had been thinking um, at with two hour meetings. And I, I see this as going you know between now and June. And I might just offer as a just to get another idea on the on the table. Maybe there's a middle path that's like every three weeks for three hours, um, which I, I just I guess one question I have is given the number of counselors there are and the number of things we like to cover in an agenda is would two be kind of crunching it too much and would the frequency of two weeks be especially with all the subcommittee meetings? Maybe I'm a little bit as many as many of us are more attuned to that than others but just as another option on the table yep i think particularly if you as a steering committee are convening co-chairs and you're getting some great cross pollination and, and visibility across the the subcommittees that way it takes a little bit of the pressure off for the full council to be doing that so you could do it every three weeks or every four weeks but maybe not the full four hours in this time right so there's i think there's opportunities there does anybody have a very strong feeling about where this should land that you'd want to put out there when we talk about this on the 26th? 
I guess I just wonder what that looks like then for um, the, our steering committee meetings, which David, you opened the meeting saying we're as as always, this is a really packed hour. We only meet once every other week. If we then also bring in the those those co-chairs and I, I think I heard somebody mention maybe we do that every off week. Uh, that might be a good solution, but if we if we don't increase how frequently we meet or the duration of our meeting, bringing in those co-chairs, I don't think is going to work either. Right. Totally agree. You have any time to more to agendas that. together. Right. Yeah, and I, and I will suggest that um, just to follow up on the idea of co-chair meetings, um, I perhaps get the sense that the co-chairs feel maxed out right now with their workload. And so the idea of asking them to convene with the steering committee every other week um, might be a big ask for co-chairs. And Julie's nodding with me. Uh, yeah, I, I, was say, I, I think I could speak for the science and data co-chairs, just knowing that they've both shared concerns with me about workload, that, that that might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Yeah. Given that, what what would be our strategy to help look across, cross pollinate, do that work that we need to do. Like what what is a, a pathway? It may it, it might be taking advantage of other existing things, not crushing people. I, I wonder and I, and here you know I'm 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 retreating on my own idea. I, I wonder if the council meetings staying as they are, but adding in the once a month Bet like between the council meetings of a steering committee with the co-chairs is enough because that actually gives you that bi-weekly yeah. sort of check-in. You have the council that bi-weekly check-in with the steering committee of the co-chairs and then a council meeting two more weeks later. Again, it, it might be enough. And we did out highlight that in our process roadmap as the way to convene co-chairs to have cross-pollination. And then would you suggest, Jane, shrinking the count, the full council meeting to maybe three hours still every once a month? Because that other conversation would be taking place outside of that construct. I do. I, I, I think that some of the um, the meetings that have have gained length because we were in this learning information gathering phase. And if we're really in this um, phase where we're hearing from the subcommittees and deliberating on, you know, points of, that they need clarity on at that minute. And that's really what the intention is of the council for these next few months. I, I suspect that four hours is too long that we can actually just stick with, um, you know, three hour meetings and, and build out uh, accordingly. Okay. okay. So like with that. that once a month steering committee co-chairs meeting, be a little longer since we're still only meeting every other week and one hour doesn't seem to be sufficient or it's already packed as is. Yeah, well, I asked that of you all. Do you feel like that because the, they could stay one hour and that would be that one meeting was focused on the council agenda and one meeting was fo focused on co-chair cross pollination. I still agree that one hour is short, um, but I also recognize that you all are very busy and one hour may be all that you have to give. So that that could be the focus of every other week, the agenda building and then the co-chair invite in. Or we could go longer for that if we have other business. It, if, it, if folks it, want to, go ahead. And maybe it's obvious since they're all public meetings, but I think in that event, it might also be worth explicitly saying that if there are council members who want to hear updates from the other subcommittees that they would be welcome to to join that it wouldn't be kind of exclusive to the steering committee and the and the co-chairs of the subcommittees right it would be kind of an optional but not required council meeting which also i would hope could satisfy the need of the legislators to know what's going on in the um, subcommittees they could tune into that particular meeting and they'll have a half hour or 45 minute opportunity to view the reports themselves directly from the co-chairs. Correct. Yep. Okay. This is great. I want to say I think we got as far as we're going to get. Let's do this again on the 26th and, and solidify, but it sounds like where we're landing as a steering committee is to keep the council meetings once a month, tighten up the time a little bit more closer to three hours. Um, you all uh, also once a month uh, 
in this sort of off time are meeting with the co-chairs and that's a supplemental meeting for you guys. Um, and so that's where that cross pollination and, and look across. It's very, you're inviting other counselors to be, to like be part of that and witness that. Um, and then it's also conserved the needs of the legislature as, as Liz and, and Secretary Young said. Um, I'm seeing hands, uh, Liz and then Secretary Young. Yeah, um, my, uh, so great, sounds good. And the idea of using one steering committee for one, per, one steering committee meeting for one purpose and the other for the agenda, that's great. Um, I would suggest we lengthen our steering committee meetings. Sorry, uh, I think an additional half an hour, at least for the ones where we're getting the co-chair uh, a report out would be um, appropriate, at least at first. Um, I'm concerned about public comment time. Uh, in particular, given the purpose of those cross-pollination meetings, and I wouldn't want to see us try to rush through 50 minutes and then not have enough time for that. So with okay. apologies to all of our calendars, that's my suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Secretary Young? No, I just wanted a clarification. Um, just remind me, because it's it's legislative se season here. Our, this, the Climate Council Steering Committee already meets twice a month, right? Okay. So you mentioned, David, that you thought this meeting with co-chairs would be supplemental to our regular right, meetings. I just want to clarify that. I think what we're saying is one meeting of the two will be devoted to the co-chairs and be longer. And then the next meeting, the second meeting will be devoted to council business and doing the next agenda or whatever business we have to do. Okay. So not an extra meeting, but an extra 30 minutes. Great. Sounds like a plan. And then I get, again, just, you know, we'll talk to the council about it, but we could ask the co-chairs to just be prepared to do their overviews, you know, one after another for five to 10 minutes, whatever we give them. And then we can open up to questions and then public comment after. And so then we've got a comprehensive um, video of the co-chair readouts. So they, of course, they've got to feel comfortable with that and have the time to do that. Okay, well, good. That was thank you for the clarification. That's great. Okay, so we can put that idea to the full council on the 26th and let them have some chew, chew on that for a little bit and hopefully land somewhere uh, smart. Are folks moving on to another topic? Okay, moving on to another topic. Yeah, okay. Let's move on to the topic of the draft outline of the climate action plan. Um, in this, we spoke about it in our last meeting. We got some feedback on our initial draft. Um, Jane and I and others have tried to um, incorporate that feedback in a new version, which is hyperlinked in our agenda here. And I thought we could just walk through that now as a sort of test it and see how it's going to be. We're going to do this again with the full council. But you all, I think, have a really important role in sort of doing gut checks on if this is the right approach and whether we can improve this further before bringing it to the full council. So with that said, I wonder, Jane, if, if you want to share your screen again for a second. And um, hold on, I chose the wrong thing, so that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, Too many things open. We can talk about this too, but not right now. <laughs> So no matter how much work I do to get prepared to have the right things pop up when I go to share, I never have the. <laughs> oh my gosh! Sorry, you keep talking, David. I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll okay. riff for a little bit more. So what did we do? The feedback we got was it's important to make a distinguish uh, to distinguish between things, you know, ideas and strategies and recommendations that are ready to go. Uh, in those that require some more work. It's also important to understand that it, we it's different to talk about 2025 and 2030 and talk about 2050. And so the way we've tried to organize this is we've organized it first by doing three big buckets, which is mitigation, sequestration, and resiliency and adaptation, right? So those three big buckets. It's dangerous to do that because we know that some measures are you know deal with all uh, or some combination of those but just for organization's sake we've done that for the mitigation pieces 
Uh, we separate it out between the areas that we know are the big ticket items for emissions reductions. So that's going to be transportation. It's going to be buildings, electricity, and non-energy. Okay, and then there's a thing at the bottom there around a cumulative assessment. Now, if you can scroll back up for just a second, um, Jane, please, you'll see that for each one of these, what what we're suggesting as an organization is uh, two big buck or two, essentially two big ideas: strategies for immediate implementation, right? Things that are ready to go, basically, and they can pivot into rulemaking, legislation, or some other pathway for implementation. And for those, we have a particular emphasis on how those actions are helping us meet the 2025 and 2030 requirements, right? And we're going to have analysis about equity and justice implica implications and economic impacts, right? So for those immediate implementation pieces, we are giving the basics of this is what it is. Uh, these are some of the key analysis we can do around impact, both in terms of emissions reductions, equity, and economic stuff, and we'll give some cost considerations. Then we're going to have ideas in this that are called strategies requiring additional development, where we can say, here's some really good ideas that came out of our work. They're not quite ready for prime time or rulemaking or this kind of stuff, right? But they're good ideas and we want to put them out there. We recognize there's next steps needed to flesh them out and get them ready from implementation, right? This is, I don't know if I, it's, this is the right word to use, but this is some degree our escape valve, right? This is the ability to say, here's some really good ideas. We're not quite ready uh, to pivot them right into implementation. There's going to be a process after December 1st to flesh them out. OK, so for on the again, we're just in mitigation right now. So on these mitigation steps, this is this is what you would have in each one. And with each bucket, you are able to say ready to go into implementation, need some additional work. And at the bottom of this, you do your analysis. If you scroll just a little bit, Jane, where we talk about the oh, not too, a little too much, the cumulative assessment. Uh, at the bottom of this mitigation section, you do have to have your modeling that shows for the things that are ready to go, right? How do they get you to your 2025 and 30 requirements? Right? So you want to have a package of ready to go things that are coherent with 2025 and 2030 targets. And so you need that consolidated package. All right. So then strategies for sequestration, we do a similar breakdown. Nice. One well, comment, David, on this yeah, part. Please. We all should. This additional considerations was supposed to be sort of the bucket that gets us at the long-term vision for 2050. So the further out um, idea ideas that we know are going to be part of the mix at some point, but aren't at all ready to really flesh out in detail yet. Right. Go ahead. And, and Secretary Moore, do you want to um, comment on something right now? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to ask if there was a reason we hadn't specifically called out agriculture under the strategies for mitigation, recognizing it's a more significant contributor than electricity. Yeah. Well, we have the, it, it, this is the, the these are the way that the cross sector mitigation has organized. And so this is the way I then pulled it into the plan. So they have task leads um, in these buckets working on strategies and recommendations. So transportation, buildings, electricity, and non-energy emissions. And they put um, agriculture under non-energy emissions. Exactly, then. but okay. but we met, you're right with all the attention on that. And, and I think this is sort of just, again, the first draft, and you'll certainly see that as we get into sequestration and resilience on how I framed the topic areas. But um, the non-energy emissions one, we may call out ag since it is 11% or, you know, such a significant portion of those non-energy emissions rather than lumping it. Okay, thank you. That's great. So for sequestration, a similar logic of strategies that are ready for implementation now in strategies requiring additional development and additional considerations thinking forward. <clears throat> um, and again, just for everybody's knowledge, the, the titles, um, 
get at the buckets in the way they've organized the work of that work subcommittee, carbon budget, forest and natural land sequestration, agricultural land sequestration, nature-based solutions, and economic and food systems. Yeah. And, and then again, cumulative assessment. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So it all adds up kind of thing. Yeah. Strategies for resiliency and adaptation here. Um, <clears throat> this is language that also comes out of the statute to some degree, and that's why it's a, it gets you a little bit. Um, you know, you, you have reducing residential, you know, municipal school district and residential fossil fuel consumption, which obviously falls under the mitigation piece, but it's here because it's sort of how the statute groups it and how the subcommittees are working on it. But we can link in a report uh, these things together. Again, we're not as fleshed out here. We'd welcome some thoughts, but using that logic of things that are ready now for implementation, things that are good ideas coming out of process, but are just aren't ready yet and need some further development. And and I'll just say that I, I've sort of teed this up in the subcommittees or and or with the co-chairs perhaps, but you know, there's it, it feels a lot clearer based on the statute what's required of this first plan for the mitigation section, but I think this it feels a little more open ended of what will be included in this first plan versus um, plans down the road around sequestration and resiliency work. And so that's the conversation now happening around work planning and with those task leads about what what do they want to see with respect to specificity and goals for those um, program areas or targets, I should say, within each of the sequestration and resiliency sections. Yeah. Lauren? Yeah, recognizing, like, as you said, David, at the beginning of this, that there's obvious overlap between those three, that three-legged stool of the reduction of emissions, removal of emissions through uh, sequestration storage, and then resilience and adaptation. I do think because we pulled ag emissions up into the emissions reductions, even though it's um, largely being considered by the Ag and Ecosystem Subcommittee, at least at first, um, that the food systems, economic and food systems and nature-based solutions, the, they certainly will have a little bit of carbon sequestration work. Those largely fall under resilience and adaptation in a way that I want to make sure that we're thinking holistically about what climate resilience and climate adaptation looks like. And as it reads currently, it seems hyper-focused on emergency preparedness in a way that I don't think presents the full view of what of what it should be. So just would recommend that those two get pulled down, even though they're happening happening in agriculture and ecosystems, that when they actually get folded into the climate action plan, they be in the appropriate section. That makes That's a lot of sense. Helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, our report doesn't have to track perfectly like which subgroup worked on it. Right. So that's I think that's that's a great thing. Um, Secretary Moore. Sure, I was just going to ask and Jane, maybe you said this and I missed it, but is the additional considerations sub sub area in each of these meant to also highlight places where we need existing or we need additional research and development? Yes, very much so. And I didn't mention that we have some of it at the end also around um, implementation. So implementing Vermont's climate action plan should certainly speak to ongoing research and development. But I also think um, that would very much focused on each of the sectors um, to place it within the additional considerations makes a lot of sense. And, and David and I spoke about it that way. OK, great. Yeah, I just I, I think because the, the strategies requiring additional development, I feel like those are, are largely going to be things that are close. Right. <laughs> right. And there may be some things that just don't even really exist yet that we need ultimately to reach the 2050 goal um, and ha need a place to, for those to live as well. Great. Yeah, that's exactly the idea. Liz? Uh, maybe I can hold it for co-chair first discussion with steering committee. I was kind of wondering, I'll just tell you the topic. I was wondering how the strategies for resiliency and adaptation, once you get to the municipal vulnerability index and lower those last three or four items, um, how those are considered to be different than strategies for immediate implementation or requiring additional development. I, I guess I just from an organizational point of view, I don't under I don't quite understand from the outline 
what the subcommittee's view is there. Because it feels to me that the more that we can have consistency between section presentations, the easier it will be for the public and policymakers to use. So if, for example, municipal vulnerability index is something that not only taking work underway, but you know, is something that we need to promote for continued implementation immediately. Yeah, you get the idea. I'm not sure why I, it's separate. I, I, I completely support what you're saying, Liz. And um, I think this in particular doesn't flow at all right. And David alluded to that already. And um, at, in sort of struggling with like grasping at straws for how to like bucket the resilience. I just went with, again, the way they've organized by task leads and how they're splitting up the work. I in no way see the resilient, I should have said this from the onset, see this as how we would actually structure the resiliency section, because I do think like the municipal vulnerability index is simply a tool um, and would flow under another strategy. Um, so yeah, I, I think there'll be a lot of work still on this, but really thinking about yeah. the broad, um, outline as as just okay. setting us up for a st structural conversation with each section with those subcommittee leads. Great. That's helpful, Liz. Jared? Um, uh, my comments are um, broader um, and more on the beginning part, so I'm happy to come back to those if we want to stay focused on this section. No, I say let's go straight to that because we're kind of at time. So I'd love to, you know, what are your comments, Jared, on this? Okay. The, the first one would be, and if you can scroll up just a little bit more, maybe <laughs> minimize, sorry. Um, I, I just want to say that I think it's, and I, I believe that this is the intent. Well, first, let me say this is much uh, improved from last time. Thank you for the work that you, Jane, and David and others have, have put into it. Um, just a couple of clarifying things. Um, I do think it's really important since, at least in terms of the statutory requirements, we're only going to be required to submit one climate action plan before 2025, that all of the strategies for immediate implementation add up to meeting the 2025 requirements. Um, I can imagine that for other years, we could point to things that need to be more fully assessed, but in the you know, in the scenario in which there's no other plan until 2025, we need to make sure that the rec the strategies for immediate implementation can get us to those 2025 requirements. Um, so that's that's. Can I answer? One. Can I answer that for one second? Yeah. I, I I totally I completely support that. And just to um, respond and ask of all of you. What I suspect, though, is that your strategies for immediate implementation will likely add up to something beyond 20, 2025 targets or have the potential to rate right in this first plan. And so what I thought and wanted to suggest is that we be able to speak to how far this plan gets us going forward to the 2030 goal, statutory requirements, I should say, and be able to sort of have that springboard for the next plan and and so show that we've added up to 2025 which we know we have to do with this plan but also show how far we're going beyond it in order to get us on the right foot forward to the 2030 statutory requirements so that's why it didn't feel right to like totally pull those apart but i i hear you and if there's a better way to try to get at that or and if you agree with me on that and think of a better way to reflect that that would be great yeah. i'll i'll think about it a, a little bit more. I'm also happy to kind of send some thoughts kind of outside of the meeting as I have more time with it. But that mm -hmm. makes a lot, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense, Jane. And I would just say that like, you know, being so immersed in these numbers, I think one of the things that a lot of folks may not recognize, although probably most of the folks in this group do, is that meeting the 2030 requirements, it doesn't sound like much more because we're going from a 26% reduction to a 40% reduction. Right, the effect of that baseline change Going from a high emissions year to a low emission year, we basically have to do three times as much to meet the emissions reduction required for 2030 is about, you know, on a gross level, three times larger than 2025. So I think it does make sense to speak to, you know, how are we going to then get towards that ramp rate, which significantly will have to increase after 2025. Um, the last couple of things, um, I would suggest that we change, I really like assessment of action. Um, and I think that we should use that same language assessment for equity and justice and economic. I think sometimes folks 
um, hear impacts and they immediately think negative, whereas there are going to be many positive benefits in terms of consumer savings, in terms of advancing equity. So, and we don't want to put our thumb in the scale. There'll be some positive, some negative. I think more neutral language would be to say, you know, we want an assessment of action that includes an equity and justice assessment and includes an economic assessment rather than impacts. And I apologize. I think I'm the one who suggested impacts originally, but as I've thought about it more, I think assessment makes more sense. The last thing I have is just a quick clarification up front where it says a letter from the co-chairs. I wasn't clear what co-chairs meant. Was that from um, the chair, Secretary Young, or was that from the steering committee, or was that the co-chairs of the subcommittees? Um, I don't think it's a, a major deal. I just, it was, if it's unclear to me, I imagine it might be unclear to others. That might be a holdover from Maine. <laughs> well, yes and no. I mean, it, I, I think that the, these introductions at the beginning are really nice, and I, I suspect it would could it could mean all of the above, you know, a letter from the chair, you know, Secretary Young, as well as letters from the co-chairs of the specific subcommittee. So we can clarify that and consider it further as we get down the road. I'm conscious of time. Uh, Secretary Moore, last word on this? Yeah, I just wanted to reflect that um, while we have to deliver a climate action plan at least once every four years, I don't think that there's anything that limits us to that. And I don't think we should should necessarily um, if we are struggling, I guess I'm envisioning there's a lot of change happening right now at the federal level, and we may not have full eyes into what it means for us. And if we need to put pins in a handful of things in terms of our approach to 2025 pending final outcome at the federal level around certain initiatives, I don't want us to feel like we, we can't do that. And so just reflecting back that we have to do it at least once every four years, but there's nothing that says we couldn't adopt an updated climate action plan um, sometime in earlier mid 2022 or, or by the end of 2022, if we feel like the landscape is evolving in a manner that, that necessitates that. Great. Yeah, I think transmitting that message again and again is helpful. Okay, so let's leave it there and say, we'll we'll make an even better version for the 26th, but I'm glad we did this first uh, test with you all. Um, uh, this iteration is working really well, like iterating like this with you all is very helpful. Okay, um, and remember the ultimate goal there is everybody has a sense of like, I understand what needs to be in here and I understand how we're gonna deal with stuff that's just too complicated to get done by December 1st. And December 1st, we'll get us to our 2025 goals. All right. Um, so quick version of this. Jane, subcommittee membership update. What do we need to say on that real quick? Take two seconds. Let's, awesome. As long as I can find it. <laughs> okay. Um, you all have been uh, gracious in approving subcommittee members. We just have two quick changes that I wanted to put in front of you. Um, Chad, Chad Farrell, who's a council member, serves on rural resilience and adaptation, um, would like to and is interested in liaisoning with cross-sector mitigation. Cross-sector mitigation would love to have him. Um, and so, uh, but formally, I said I would bring it all to you. Um, and then at Just Transitions has appointed an additional member, Kashka Orlo. And that just came to me today. And um, David, I, since you're, I, I tried to reach out to get a little bit of background on the broader expertise that she's bringing that we're currently missing on the committee, but I actually don't have that. But Sue, um, as well as the other co-chairs are all advocating for her to join the subcommittee um, for her perspective, which I'm not 100% sure what that additional perspective is, but um, hopefully, do you know it, David? Either. We have yeah. the Just Transition Committee has talked about getting folks who can better reflect um, income, uh, you know, diversity of income views. So particularly low income yes. views. And I don't know if that's what's going on here because I don't know the person here. Yeah. So I don't know. So it, I guess the where we are right now with you all folks is what you're seeing. Any concerns here that you want to flag? Um, yeah. This is kind of a sort of courtesy that, that make sure that you all are fully aware and you can uh, jump in. Uh, Lauren? No concerns with the two highlights, just to bring up something that Chris Campany brought up, I think at our last year in committee meeting, and since he's not here, I'll echo it for him, that the need to get a labor economist either on the science and data subcommittee 
or the Just Transition Subcommittee. I think that's going to be absolutely critical to the conversation. Um, and then the Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee, just to say it's looking uh, like there's not that much membership and I know that they've run into troubles I've heard with getting people to commit the time to do the work but again looking at rural resilience and adaptation from that holistic not just emergency preparedness lens there there seems to be significant expertise or or voice in that room for the for the full scope of what that subcommittee is working on so just flagging that to say if they should be going back to their full list uh, Jane that you came up with when people submitted nominations and not try harder, that sounds terrible, but reach out to more people perhaps, or maybe we should make a more public plea for people who are interested to join. So just to count, to suggest the approach that we've chosen to take there, Lauren and others, is that um, at this point they've exhausted the nomination list with respect to the, that expertise. I will say they really did go deep on it. Um, and what I've done is reached out this week to reinforce having a &R staff join that conversation with rural resilience um, because that's the only subcommittee where agencies a and r staff specifically aren't staffing it currently um, and we i got positive feedback about both the hope a fish and wildlife subcommittee member and uh well i shouldn't say a subcommittee a staff member as well as a dec staff member being um, monitoring emails um, monitoring agendas and stepping in when um, an agenda needs their um, experience to speak to at that so it, it doesn't it doesn't go far enough but they brought three separate people in um, from outside organizations to try to bring that expertise and all have declined okay so um do we want to do the two minute version of uh legislative update on this, I don't know how that feels to do, Secretary Moore. But if you want to do the speed dating version of how it went, uh, what people <laughs> yes. need to know. Sure. So uh, Jane, Liz, Chris, and I all made an appearance in House Energy and Technology uh, last week. This was our first foray into the um, bringing the steering committee members from the part of the legislature that that put them on the council along with, with myself and Jane. Um, we gave a high level overview of the, the council's work today um, and I think collectively left them with the impression uh, that we are moving very aggressively to implement the, the vision of the Global Warming Solutions Act, that it, there are some challenges associated with the, the timeline um, and and also just uh, provided an update on sort of the formation of the subcommittees and and the work that's underway in those spaces, as well as our efforts uh, to contract and make good use of the resources that have been provided um, in support of the council's work. I don't know Jane or, or Liz, and I don't know if Chris is one of the guests whose initials aren't on here, but Jane or Liz, if you'd like to, to add um, to any of that. No, I think that was great and uh, yeah, all good. It was a good, a good substantive update. Wonderful. OK. OK, good. Um, before I jump to public comment, are there other things that people need to raise up? Anything else that we've missed? Oh, uh, Jared, if you're trying to talk, can we? Sorry about that. Um, I, I will just quickly say on the topic of um, other subcommittee members, um, I, I don't know if we ended up agreeing that the recommendations of those subcommittees um, sounded good, but I will just say on the science and data subcommittee, we consciously chose to hold on the addition of someone with economics experience and expertise because at least one and potentially more of the candidates under consideration were are involved in the RFI response. And so we want to get through the selection process of the RFP, but we still are gonna come back and add that expertise potentially to the subcommittee, but we recognize that right now is not the right time to do that given potential conflicts of interest. That's smart, yeah, okay. That's helpful, thanks, Jared. Okay. Um, so why don't we do a little bit of see if anyone who's joining us uh, from the public or observing us today would like to make a comment. Feel free to raise your hand. Uh, this is a good time, folks, if you want to make a comment. <clears throat> I'll just give it a moment more, folks. Anybody who's joining us today 
wants to chime in on any of these topics we've been talking about. Okay, great. Okay, folks, so um, in conclusion, uh, the agenda for the 26th we're on board with. We have some specific ideas we've spoken about in terms of how to manage this challenge of getting cross pollinization and use the council effectively and use your space and convening the co chairs. We have some specific ideas on that we've taken down and we will talk about that in the meeting. We have some nice um, improvements on this outline we just talked about, which will also um, improve before the 26th meeting. We'll make sure it's posted up there. Um, and uh, in subcommittee membership, we said OK and we clarified some challenges that are happening. What else? Anything else? Good. OK. Um, all right, folks, I think we did it and we will see you all on the 26th. Um, and I don't think we need to update that agenda, but I will be sitting around an annotated agenda, maybe internally for, for Jane and other people who will be presenting on that um, on the 26th. OK, I think that's it, folks. OK, thanks, everybody. Good luck, Liz. Thank Great, you. thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye -bye. Good work, team. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Be well. Yeah.